Well, this week we get to conclude our series on the wilderness, this season where we see Jesus being led by the Spirit um, into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. The enemy comes and he tempts Jesus and he says, hey, if you're the Son of God, why don't you prove yourself? He says, if you're the Son of God, why don't you test God and let God prove himself? And he says, you know, I'll tell you what, I'll give you everything that you came for if you'll just bow down and worship me. This idea of temptation, this this temptation that, that sometimes we face to prove ourselves. The temptation that sometimes we have that, that we must test God, that God must show himself or God must prove himself to us. The temptation that at times we have to take an easy way, even if it's not the Father's way. You know, it's interesting because after those temptations, Jesus says, away from me, Satan, the angels come and they minister to him. And then Jesus begins to minister. He goes from one wilderness, really, uh, to a new wilderness. The wilderness of his public ministry. These same temptations, these same trials, they come in this season of Jesus' ministry as well. He's still tested. He's still tempted with, with the thought that he has to prove himself. He's still tested. He's still tempted with, with people telling him that God must 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 prove himself to Jesus. He's still tempted and tested with, hey, there could be an easier way to accomplish this plan that the Father has. The Israelites faced it in the wilderness. You know, you and I, we face these same temptations day after day, time and time again in life. It shouldn't surprise us when we're tested by the enemy to prove ourselves. We're tested by the enemy to test God, to have him prove himself to us. It shouldn't surprise us when we're tested or tempted by the enemy to take an easy way. It's something that is normative to mankind. It's happened time and time again. And Jesus proceeds to go into his public ministry. And in the next chapter, we see a sermon that Jesus preaches that consumes three chapters in the book of Matthew. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And in this chapter, Jesus teaches a profound prayer that I believe when we hear it, it should lead us back to the wilderness. It's almost as though he learned something in the wilderness that he wants us to remember to pray. Matthew chapter 6 says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's impossible to not read the end of that prayer. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil and not think of Jesus' time in the wilderness. He ends his prayer with this because I believe what he's praying directly correlates to what he experienced in the wilderness. Now, where does this prayer start? It says, our Father who art in heaven. You know, that's an identity thing. You know, when we know who God is, sometimes we struggle with who God is. Jesus is saying, who is it you're praying to? When you pray to God, you're praying to the Father. There's only four people on this earth that calls me father, and those are the ones who are my children. Remember what the enemy said every time in the wilderness, if you are the son of God. You see, we need to know our identity is absolutely in Christ. We need to know that he is our God, and we we are his children. So when we know his identity, then we start to pray with responsibility. The next prayer is, hallowed be your name. You know, those are words that we don't always use. Those are words that are different to us. I'm not sure normally in my everyday conversation I use the word hallowed. And I wonder if we recognize what that means. It's a Greek word that means to treat as holy, to set apart as holy, to sanctify, to hallow, to purify. So we're setting apart as holy what? The name of God. Hallowed be your name. And again, when we use the word name, sometimes we simplify that understanding. The Greek word for name meant much more than just Steve Mallory. But it meant everything associated with my name. Everything the name covers, every thought that's roused in your mind by mentioning, hearing, remembering, 
the name, one's rank, their authority, their interests, their pleasure, their commands, their excellence, and their deeds. Your name was more than just the word or letters attached to you, but it was everything you were, the essence. So what are we praying? We're praying, God, may we make holy everything that you are. It's a reminder to me of my responsibility. As a child of God, I'm his representative in this world. And I long that God's name be made holy in me and through me. That my life is lived in such a way that the name of God is made holy. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Looking back at the temptation... You know, the enemy offers to give Jesus everything, all the kingdoms, everything that he came to accomplish. What? If he would bow down and call him Lord. It was it was this change of identity. Jesus could not hallow the name of God and worship Satan. There was no way for his life to be a reflection of this if he worshiped Satan. Jesus said we can't put the Lord our God to the test. The Lord is his name name. He is who he is. He is the I am. He is the author and finisher. To hallow, to revere, to make holy his name, I must be completely obedient to him. He says, then pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, this is a challenging one. It's the one that Jesus faced when the enemy took him up on the pinnacle of the temple and he said, jump off. And Jesus said, no, I must not test God, but I must trust God. You see, sometimes it's hard to trust God's way. We have to trust his way. Not my will, but yours be done. That was the prayer of Jesus in the garden. You know, recall the cross, Mark chapter 15. Those who passed by hurled in insults at him, shaking their heads, saying, So, you're going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. You know, that's the reality of what Jesus is facing on the cross is a bunch of people saying, hey, why don't you do this your way? Why don't you come off the cross? Why don't you come down from that? Yeah, God might have a plan, but, but he loves you, right? You know, in Matthew, we see they say he would send his angels to, to bring you off the cross. Why don't you ask God to send his angels to bring you off the cross? This, this moment of, of Jesus' confidence in saying, not my will, but yours be done. The next words that he speaks. At three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near him heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on his staff, offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes down to take him. He said with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. The kingdom of God, your kingdom come. Your will be done. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God was revealed in the radical obedience of Jesus, even though the words of others, even though the feelings he had, the kingdom of God was revealed because Jesus Christ knew who the Father was. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, the the temptation in the wilderness, Jesus was hungry. That was where he was vulnerable. And the enemy says, hey, why don't you just use your power to do your thing? And Jesus says, no, I can't use mine for that, but I must trust the Father to do that for me. We get hearkened back to Israel that every day God sent them manna to consume. You know, God was good. He could have done whatever he wanted with the Israelites in the wilderness. He gave them clothes that didn't wear out and shoes that didn't wear out, but he called them to get bread daily. We must daily have dependence on God. We must recognize daily that I am not enough, but I need the Father. 
Every day, I, I, I have so much. Every day, there's, it's so easy to put my trust in what I have rather than what I need. We live in a society, in a world where, where we don't really know what need truly is at times. We can become self-sufficient, not God-dependent. And we need to trust in Him in all ways, in all things. You know, these verses, uh, they continue on. And, and Jesus says, uh, forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know, later on in, in the book of, uh, in the verses that follow, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Uh, this doesn't necessarily go back to the wilderness in my understanding, but when we're looking at the Lord's prayer, we must look at this reality that we must forgive. And our forgiveness is measured by the way we forgive others. Talk about a standard. Jesus taught us to pray because he knew we would need to pray this prayer. We would need to know our identity in him, our responsibility as children of God, that we could trust his way and lean on him every day. I hope that you can pause and reflect at the words in, in this prayer. I hope you can see yourself in this situation, in your wilderness, that you can find your Father, that you can trust in Him in all ways and lean on Him every day. The Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face shine upon you, be gracious to you, may He turn His face towards you, grant you His peace. And may you thrive knowing you're a child of God, even though you might be in some wilderness. Be blessed.